being a black man in America isn't easy. The hunt is on. And you are the prey. All I'm saying is, all I'm saying is, survive. All right. George Zimmerman is thinking he's Sylvester Stallone. Guns and pesticides are getting sprayed like cologne. Adolescent teens acting like Al Capone. They're spying on us using military drones. I really love Apple, but they tap in my phone. Eight year old girl superiors, but ain't full grown. Maybe it's the milk, maybe it's the hormones. Infecting Africans with AC walking around full grown. They're raising the interest rates that are on my student loans. The hood is hurting, we refuse to hit her moans. Cannibals and cancer eating away at our bones. I try to speak the truth, they told me. My phone. We generation X because the future's unknown. The top notch schools are out of our zip code zones. Gang violence, blood, crips, and black stones. This is plain English. We don't need Rosetta Stone. Now, if you want to talk about uh, guns, why is it that there's a gun shop on almost every corner in this community? Why? There you are. For the same reason that there's a liquor store on almost every corner in the black community. Why? They want us to kill ourselves. You go out to Beverly Hills, you don't see that shit. But they want us to kill ourselves. It's feeling like the devil finally claimed the stone. Kids are mimicking behavior from TV that's shown. Cancer from the meat we eat that's genetically cloned. Now we sniff bath sauce, airplane doing acetone. Heroin addicted babies placed on methadone. Fathers in jail for oxycodone. Children need chaperones because parents left them alone. The piece of unleavened bread can we at least share a stone? Chasing the cheese, the cheddar, that overload. Now we gender switching and swapping testosterone. Girls are ruining their body using bad silicone. Because our skin is copper tone Profiling and harassing That I don't condone Am I a whistleblower Or was that my trombone Gabriel blew a horn Till we hear saxophone White supremacist Hoodies in the shape of a cone And we are being crucified By a process That is turning black Into a permanent underclass Here Frank A permanent underclass No no see, Nobody wants to talk about that Nobody This is how you Mission Aaron Zill About Mozart Has nothing to do with our problem Nothing what good is Mozart going to do a bunch of children who can't go out and get a job? All we talk about are lead jets we flown. All we talk about are made backs we own. All we talk about is some shots of Patron. All we talk about is some chick we bone. All we talk about is some gangster that's gone. All we talk about is ballin' like our father's car alone. Acting like we untouchable, knowing that we prone. We never talk about the plantation we own. We never talk about how bank accounts are overdrawn. We never talk about how times are like barriers. We talk about his ego, but no court I don't. We never talk about our pain like cortisone. We never talk black power, it's always postponed. We never talk about the earth or the ozone. And how prisons turn street thugs into modern cones. And how the CIA sold drugs with blind dome. Damn it, I'm gone. Well, how you think the crack drop gets into the country? We don't own any planes. We don't own no ships. We are not the people who are flying and floating that shit in here. I know every time you turn on the TV, that's what you see, black people, selling the rock, pushing the rock, pushing the rock. Yeah, I know. But that wasn't a problem as long as it was here. It wasn't a problem until it was in Iowa, and it showed up on Wall Street where there are hardly any black people. Yeah, the best way you can destroy a people, you take away their ability to reproduce themselves. Nation, join us now for the pendulum with Dr. Samori Swigert, a platform that encourages the four D's of philosophy discussion, discourse, dialogue, and debate. Prepare to travel from the past, present, and have discussions of future implications and projections with a correlation to African Americans. These topics are intended to grab your attention, cause contemplation, and encourage some form of action. From the world, to the White House, to the hood, and everything good, the pendulum is swinging your way. Source Nation, here is your host, Dr. Samori Swigert.
Welcome, welcome, welcome once again. Great Wednesday hump day. Source Nation, how are you doing? This is Dr. Samari Swagger, a.k.a. Doc Swag. Once again, I'm wishing you tremendous blessings with health, family, love, career, success, spiritual progress, and the accomplishment of your dreams. Now, Source Nation, as you always do, get ready to get intellectually intimate. And before we do, you know the ritual, you know the routine. Get your coffee, get your wine, get your water. If you want to turn your water into wine, that's fine. And always remember to pass me my shoehorn so I can put my foot all up in the topic of the day. Make sure you share the link with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media platforms. I'm your host, Dr. Samori Swagger, a.k.a. Dr. Swag, and I want to welcome you to my show, The Pendulum. Now, some people are like, well, you know, why are you call a show The Pendulum? Well, a pendulum. It's an apparatus that people associate with a clock. It helps gauge time and space. It traverses through time in a constant backward and forward motion. Some would say retrograde to anterior grade. And this is what we'll do throughout the show as we engage topics. We have to connect the dots of the past, present, and future. This show is designed to encourage the four Ds, debate, dialogue, discussion, and discourse. Gather your friends and family as we prepare to travel from the past to the present and have discussions of future implications and projections with a correlation to African Americans. From the world to the White House to the hood and everything good, the pendulum is swinging your way. Now, Source Nation, I am very happy, very, very, very happy. Bring this brother on uh, today. Um, we're in for a treat. We're in for a treat. Uh, we have a dynamic individual, uh, and his name is Mr. Mitchell Chance. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Mr. Mitchell Chance. In case you don't know, Mitchell Chance is a native of Philadelphia whose life is dedicated to the mental, emotional, spiritual, and financial repairing of Africans in America. He's a sought-after speaker whose words revolutionize the minds of those who listen. He is a five-time author, a mentor to hundreds, a developer of leaders, and he's committed to restoring his people to their rightful place of honor in this world. Whether speaking or writing, he's exposing people to hidden truths with hopes that his words will cause people to think for themselves and be awakened from the mental slumber so many of us are in. If you follow this brother on social media outlets and YouTube, you see him consistently dropping jewels for us to conduct a thorough introspective analysis and internal inventory on why we do what we do. And also, cogently posing questions that force us into a root cause analysis of our condition. Mitchell Chance takes a firm, well-planted stance on black nationalism and liberation of black people, catching the baton of our forefathers and carrying the torch of our ancestors. Mitchell Chance isn't just talking the talk, but he's also walking the walk. Highly active in the community. You see him speaking at cultural festivities, speaking truth to power at neighborhood rallies, and being that clarion call to the masses in his community and in such precarious, highly volatile era in the United States. It's always a blessing to have a brave soldier taking a stand. So when we come back from break, we're going to have a very good discussion with this brother, Mitchell Chance. We're going to be focused on um, thought, speech, and corrective behavior, things we need to be doing, should be thinking about, as Africans in America, um, and, and that, that falls in line with the thought process and logic of Dr. Francis Cress Wilson and Neely Fuller, thought, speech, and action. Source Nation, we're going to take a quick break, and after the break, we'll be back with Mr. Mitchell Chance. Peace. Source Nation, stay tuned. You're listening live to The Pendulum with Dr. Samori Swigert. Radio Network is just one of the many platforms that is used to fulfill dreams of our listeners and create a purpose that will impact the lives of our communities, cities, and the world. It is often said that great things will happen when a group of driven people work together to accomplish one goal. We're giving people the opportunity to have a voice. 
translate words that haven't been heard, and paint pictures that no one has seen. Source Radio Network is fueling your life's purpose. How can you listen? www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash source radio. Welcome back, Source Nation. You're listening live to The Pendulum with Dr. Samori Swigert. Source Nation, welcome back to The Pendulum. I'm your host, Dr. Samori Swigert, a.k.a. Doc Swag. Before we went on break, I was telling you that we have a good brother out of Philadelphia that's going to be talking shop with us, um, going over things, maybe paradigm shifting for some of us, um, or just reinforcing for some of us, or just enlightening for some of us. Um, And I said, this brother's name is Brother Mitchell Chance. And so with no further ado, Source Nation, let's welcome Mr. Mitchell Chance. Mitchell, how you doing, brother? I'm I'm doing pretty good, man. You make, you make me sound like I'm somebody, man. <laughs> <laughs> man, you are somebody. That's what James Brown no, said. Man, you make, know, sir. I said, oh man, he making he making me sound good, man. He making me sound good. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, we have to keep our warriors inspired, uplifted, and motivated. You know, always. Yeah, I appreciate it. I definitely appreciate okay. the invitation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, what I like to do when we have uh, guests on the show. Um, a lot of times people will get things rolling and then before uh, you know it, the show is done and they forget to uh, plug themselves. So what I like to do is usually we have people on that have books or products or different things to go ahead and put that out there so people know how to get in contact with them or even purchase some of their, um, you know, whatever they have to offer. So with that being said, how can people reach you on social media? Do you have a website, social media handles, uh, things of that nature? Well, they can definitely go directly to my website, which is M Chance Speaks. M as initial chance, C H A N C, regular old chance speaks with an S, M Chance Speaks dot com. Uh, to go in there, see the different videos, different blogs. I'm, I'm about to step my blogs up, so I'll be blogging at least once a week on there, so it'll be some really good content. You can find me on Facebook at Mitchell Chance Speaks and on Instagram and Twitter at M Chance Speaks. So all of those channels, everything is centered around Mitchell Chance Speaks or M Chance Speaks. Uh, you can find me or you can just Google me. <laughs> just Google Mitchell Chance and everything will pop right on up. All right. Good. Great. Great. So I hope everybody got that down. And before the show's over, we'll have to repeat that um, in case you hear something you like. All right. Um, with that said, uh, Brother Chance, why don't you just tell the people a little bit about yourself, where you're from, a little bit of your background. You know, you don't have to go in heavy, but if you want to, that's on you. <laughs> All right, well, that, you know, this this question is so uh, it's so it's so deep because I feel like I've lived like three or four different lives uh, because <laughs> um, I, I I am an ever evolving individual to become my best self. Um, and if I'm becoming my best self, that's, you know, me admitting that I was not always anywhere near my best self. So I, I spent a lot of years as my worst self and, and everything that, you know, that entailed uh, living a self-hating behavior uh, and, and, and understanding that, you know, self-hating behavior doesn't necessarily mean I, I look in the mirror and hate myself because I, I sort of looked in the mirror and, 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 and felt as if I loved myself but I, 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 I really hated who I was as an African descendant as evidenced by my actions not helping my people. So if you are in anyone who's, who is an African descendant and is not helping their people, then they are, like I was, dealing with uh, self-hate issues. So I spent a lot of years uh, in the streets, spent some time in prison. I spent time in ICU because of gunshot wounds. Uh, and then I, I, I transitioned from that and um, I, I went back to school and I, I spent some time in, in corporate America, real clean cut, you know, uh, doing everything <laughs> the right way, doing what I was supposed to do, and uh, again dealing with self hate because I was succumbing to what they what they call professionalism, which does not include <laughs> anything African in it in the first place. Uh, I went from that. I, I started going to church and and I was in the church realm for a long time, 
And um, so that was a different era of my, of my life. And now uh, I haven't abandoned all the principles of, of, of the Bible, but I'm not really connected to church. Uh, or mm-hmm. no, I'm not the the church establishment uh, um, mm-hmm. any 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 more, and I'm I'm, I'm operating um, uh, more so as a prophet in that turn, uh, teaching the way he taught revolution uh, through the Bible, uh, a, a more uh, Afrocentric um, idea to everything that I'm doing. So you know, those are like the four like phases you know that I went through, and I'm again ever evolving, just trying to become my best. And and in my best, uh, helping everybody else to discover their best, which is why I write, which is why I speak, which is why I'm at rallies, which is why I'm in meetings, which is why I'm helping people start businesses. You know, every everything you know that I do is centered around the upliftment of African people spread across the diaspora. So you know, without getting too in depth of uh, of my life, I guess that's just uh, somewhat of my life in a nutshell, just the phases of it. <laughs> I, I mean, that sounds real. Sounds like you already got a, a movie uh, <laughs> about you that, that that can come out. You know, definitely, oh, definitely. All right, so this may expand that a little bit, but I'm not sure. It all depends on how you answer. I'm not sure, but how and when would you say you got into your journey of liberation and nationalism? No, again, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm ever evolving. I've always had a desire. You know, my third grade, te- my third and fourth grade teacher, Miss Moser, she's the first person who saw a speaker in me. She introduced me to Martin Luther King, made me memorize that I have a dream speech and recited it in front mm-hmm. of the school, and, and and spoke to me about one day becoming a leader like him, and speaking and galvanizing the people like him, and and, and that's something that she instilled in me. Uh, well, how old are you in third and fourth grade? Six or, you know, seven years old. Uh, she, te- she taught us Swahili. Uh, she was a, a crazy Ooh. disciplinarian. She used to beat us with rulers and everything. But she she put something in me that never left. If anybody's going as a teacher uh, and, and, and you think that you're pouring into the youth in vain, uh, don't, don't, don't believe it because this woman, my, my third and fourth grade, and the rest of my life up until I was around 24, 25, would never have looked like I paid her any attention, but it, 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 it resonated with me as I got older. So it was always in the back of my mind, but I never got to where I am today until I began to read certain things. When I, when I read, I'm going to tell you, the, the, the real turning point in my life was reading Booker T. Washington's autobiography, Up From Slavery. It hmm. was just something about him coming from being a slave and building a college within 12 years. Hmm. I mean, we don't have no excuse. You know, if, 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 mm-hmm. if, if he can be freed and 12 years later own a college, what hmm. excuse do we have? So that hmm. book just made me feel like I had unlimited possibilities of what I can do if somebody who had no, uh, really had no education, really had no nothing because he was a slave. If somebody can 12 years from slavery own a college, then there's nothing that I and our people cannot do. So I think that that book was the turning point that really pushed me over the edge. It was so powerful, mm. I made my daughter read it. I made my nephews read it. I, I made everybody close to me read the book because it had such an impact on me. So as I said, I've always been evolving, but that book right there just did something to me. And after I read that book, I just began to read, you know, discover more and more black authors, uh, more and more stories, and the more I, it's like I began to embody the ancestors. The more I began to read their works, the more I began to listen to lectures, the more I began to understand uh, their principles and ideas, they became a part of me. It's almost like when I read, like right now, I'm reading Dr. Malesi Asante's Afrocentricity, the theory of social change. And as I'm mm. reading it, I literally feel like the words are becoming a part of me. You know, mm. it's like it's like the idea. Now, he's not an ancestor. He's still quite alive. In fact, I just um, yeah. spoke for him at, at his institute. Um, but it's like as I read, the words become a part of me. So reading Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery pushed me over the edge. And everything else I've been reading and listening to now, is what's helping me to fly. Mm. Powerful. Okay. Okay. So Booker T. Washington and and 
And one thing, uh, just listening to what you're saying, because I, I can relate to you with my high school teacher. Well, my junior high teacher, uh, her name was Miss Struthers, um, and so we had to do uh, book report. And so I did my book report on uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Uh, okay. And when I was in high school, I had a teacher, Miss Pates, and so she ran the uh, Africana Club. And, you know, that was, like, after school. And, you know, she was always imparting knowledge and wisdom within us. So shout out to black teachers. Black teachers matter, definitely. Yes, definitely. unnecessary. Unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Okay. Um, let's move on to this one now. You know, you're a you say you're a five-time published author. Um, yes. People need to know this. You know, this, this is good. Black authors matter. <laughs> black literacy definitely. matters. You know, Definitely. so let the audience know the title of your books, um, where they can probably get them, and just like, you know, a small synopsis, because I don't want to take away too much time from, the, you know, the hour that we have, but, you know, a little Definitely. bit about them. I'll keep it short. Okay. All right, well, my, my very first book is titled um, Come Out of Your Tomb. It's Overcoming the Issues of Life. And in this book, I wrote from a place where, you know, as I said earlier, I was I was in the streets for a lot of years, but then I, I started going to church and I changed my life. But I was still struggling uh, with being this, this, this new believer and still wanting to do all of this old street stuff, still wanting to sell drugs, still wanting to carry a gun, still wanting to sleep around with my woman, still wanting to party and still wanting to drink. And it was, uh, I, I realized that even though I began to change, I didn't deal with old issues. I didn't deal with what drove me to do certain things. And in this book, I, it's, a, it's a step-by-step book. I think it's my most powerful book. It's a step-by-step book to help us to identify the things that have happened to us in the past because sometimes you can be 45 years old and still responding to something that happened to you while you were five. So the book takes you back to when you were five, takes you to the darkest place in your life, the place that the, where the trauma has shaped the course of the rest of your life and help you to identify what the tomb is that's been keeping you back so then you can come out of your tomb. So it's nine chapters literally with steps to take after every chapter for you to do things in order for you to bring yourself out of that tomb. Uh, the next phase, of, the next book I wrote was Transformational Growth, Four Phases of Transformation. And that was a chronicle of how I actually transformed my life. It's another book with a checklist after each chapter for things for you to actually do. And I have a lot of testimonies of people. And this is a really small book. It's only nine ninety nine. Uh, it's a really small book, but it's very powerful. It's four, um, four short chapters. But if you go through the checklist, and go through everything that I went through, there's no way your life will not be transformed. I'll give you your money back if you go through the process and you're still the same person. The third, the third book I wrote was Broken Pillars, and that's understanding the men supporting the weight of their own families without dealing with their own brokenness. Now, not only am I a speaker and an author, but I'm also a counselor, and I specifically counsel men. And I was, went through a, a, a time where every man was coming to me with relationship issues. Every man was head over heels in love with their women, but as I listened to them, I could tell they were all destroying their own relationships, even though they loved their women. But the other mm. constant I noticed between the men is that they were all broken, and it was their brokenness that was causing them to destroy their relationships. And so I wrote the book as a compilation of what I learned from these men and, and for myself also because I've dealt with a lot of the things also as to, 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 to expose the brokenness of men to themselves and to women so, they, so we can have an understanding on why men do what we do so we won't have arguments about what, because as a counselor, my, 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 my tag phrase is always the whys are more important than the whats. And too often do we deal with whats and not whys. Mm. Uh, the fourth book was The Six Days of Manhood for African-American Men which I wrote to counter uh, all, of the, all of the negative images, all of the negative ideas. We have a lot of young men and grown men who have grown up without anybody instilling in them what it really means to be an African man, not just, not, not, not just to be a man, but to be an African-American man. So I wrote The Six Days of Manhood specifically for African-American men in order to teach young black men, uh, older black men who are open to uh, learning, how to be men, and also for women to read to understand the standard that they need to be holding men to. And the last mm. book is The Great Hijack, The Stilling of the Black Talented Temp Through a System of Self-Hate, which chronicles the system of self-hate 
uh, identifies it, defines it, uh, gives the working parts of it, gives the psychological buy-ins, and really shows how systematically we have been programmed and conditioned in our minds to believe certain things that will prevent us from working for our own best self-interest, especially when it comes to our talented chest, uh, which is a concept from the W.B. Du Bois of our elite. You know, so we'll look at, you know, uh, uh, Stacey Dash, Don Lemon, David Clark. These people are, you know, all in the media, but they hate black people. You know, mm. how about, but how yeah. do they get black people to hate black people? How do rich and wealthy black people have a mindset that they're not connected to the rest of black America? And this book exposes the system as to how they get that in the minds of all of our people, specifically to remove our elite from our neighborhoods. Mm. All right. All right. And you can find Sounds all like. of all of those at mchanspeaks.com. dot com, and I have a deal. You can get all five books for uh, fifty nine ninety nine. I save about mm-hmm. twenty seven thirty dollars. <laughs> all right, all right. Sounds like a very good uh, summer reading list for all those that are listening. You have youth out there um, in the summertime. You want to increase their summer literacy. Um, and and get some culture too. That sounds like some viable options that I would exercise. And and and, all right, okay, Mitchell. I want to ask you this question because this is something that is very serious, very 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 serious. Um, a lot of hurt and disconnection has happened between the black man and the black woman, and you know, oftentimes you know, we're seeing. Uh, degrading each other, berating each other, or fighting each other is getting to a point now where you're seeing the physical abuse uh, because of the use of uh, cell phones and cameras. Um, you can see this on World Star, uh, and mm-hmm. and it's almost as if it's it's in, almost as if entertain, entertainment. Uh, the abuse that we impart on each other, um, but the thing is, you know, as a nation is made up of people, uh-huh. and, and your nation grows when, excuse me, when your people are productive. When man and woman come together and create life in a harmonious balance that sustains life and nurtures life in the form of the newborn, as a form of the children, in the form of the juveniles, so the young adults, so they become a functional, contributory citizen in that nation. Now, in this era of Trump and the Trump administration, the alt right and everything, how do we expect to survive when black men and black women are fighting each other? What are your thoughts? What's Mitchell Chance's thoughts on how we can heal and reconcile that disruption? Uh, I think um, to 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 reconcile uh, the men and women, uh, that has to start in that work in three steps. Now, but I'm gonna give a. I'm going to give a first step that's not really a part of the three steps. The first step Mm -hmm. to all of our issues is going to be recognizing who our true enemy is. So no matter matter if it's our relationship, no matter if it's uh, our our used disdain towards education, no matter if it's intercommunity crime, no matter matter what it is, the first step to everything is recognize who our true enemy is. Because if we don't recognize our real enemy, then we'll always fight our allies. So that's the, that's the first mm-hmm. step to everything. But specifically mm. dealing with the black men and black women's relationship, that has to be done in three ways, three parts. First, we have to have an apologetic spirit in place of a blame spirit. So right now we have a whole lot of, well, black men, you did this. Well, black women, well, you did this. And, well, you hurt me and you hurt me. And no dialogue ever happens uh, when people are just blaming each other. So we have to have an, an apologetic spirit, whereas, okay, so you're saying, you know, all black, you know, I mean, a bunch of black men aren't taking care of their kids. So the black man can't then turn around and say, well, y'all women so angry. That's why we abandoned y'all. It has to be, you know what, I apologize for my partner. <laughs> Right. I can't I can't blame you. And then so then on the, on the other hand, if the man is talking about some of the anger some of our women uh, uh you know have and I definitely think some of our women have anger, but I believe our women's anger is warranted. If I was a black woman angry too at the way they're being treated by the world and by their own men. Such a sidebar. Yeah. But 
you know, mm. the woman can't then say, uh, you know, if, if a man is, is, is saying, well, you know, um, it's, it's, it's time for you women to let us really be men. They can't turn around and say, well, well, black men haven't been trustworthy all this time. How can I let you be the man in my house? You know, it, it has to be an apologetic spirit. You know, the, the black man has to say, well, what part have I had in making you an angry black woman? And the black woman has to say, well, what part have I had in pushing you away? And I, I apologize for my part. You apologize for your part. And we're not going to blame anymore. We're not going to continue to shift the blame from one side to the other and back and forth like we're on some kind of seesaw. We have to have an apologetic spirit. We have to come together with the sole purpose of apologizing to each other so that we can move forward. Because if we're not going to apologize, because both sides have hurt each other equally, it's, you know, it's no men did more, women did more. No, we have hurt each other equally, but the only way we can overcome it is if we apologize for what we've done and then we move forward. Now, the next part of it is that we're going to have to intentionally uplift each other. Now, when we look throughout history, the Caucasian has made sure that the Caucasian woman was the standard of beauty. They have made mm. sure that the Caucasian man was the standard of what power and success looked like. So they mm. constantly elevated what each other was, made them the standard of what the world should be. Meanwhile, we have been indoctrinalized with this self-hate, so we degrade ourselves our culture, our homeland, and everything about us. So to the point where, you know, we had men who wanted to perm their hair to look like the white man, and we had women who wanted to perm their hair to look like the white woman. And we have succumbed to their ideas of what the standard of beauty, what the standard of power, what the standard of success is. So now we have to intentionally uplift our people to make our women's beauty the standard of beauty. I'm not, I'm not going to continue to say, well, you know, a, a dark-skinned woman is unattractive or a woman with a full nose and full lips, because I do, I would never call them big, a full nose and full lips, traditional African features. I'm not going to say she looks like a monkey or she's ugly. She is beautiful because she, the only reason we begin to look at some of our women as unattractive is because we're judging them by European standards. And if you judge an African woman by European standards, she's going to be ugly every day of the week because she don't fit in that box. So we have to elevate elevate our women as the standard of beauty, elevate our men as the standard of success, elevate our men as the standard of power, and our, our race as the standard of everything that's good and great in this world, the same way the Caucasian did. And when we begin to esteem each other, we'll see the king and the queen in each other. And then the third step, we have to have intentional actions of reconciliation. I begin to make it a point. If I see a woman walking towards me and she looks a little afraid, like thinking I'm going to do something, I, I, I made it a point to stop her and say, Queen, you will never, ever have a problem with me harming you. You will never have to think about if you see me, I'm going to harm you. In fact, if you see me, you don't have to think about another man harming you because I'm not going to allow another black man to harm you or another man of any kind of race to harm you. So I'm intentionally going out my way to make black women feel safe, to make black women feel loved, to make black women feel adored, to make black women feel as if they are meaningful to their men. So we have to have these intentional acts of reconciliation. We have to intentionally bring each other back. We have to intentionally have conversations. We have to intentionally show each other and tell each other how much we love each other. And that does, and that's not even just a black woman to black man or black man to black woman. That's also black man to black man or black woman to black woman. We got to start speaking to each other. You know, brothers, we got brothers who are afraid of, of the black man walking towards him, thinking that the black man walking towards him is going to harm him at night because he got a hoodie on. But you got a hoodie on too, and you know you only got a hoodie on because you cold. So why do you think this brother got a hoodie on trying to harm you? We're not speaking mm. to each other. We're not intentionally having acts of reconciliation, and, 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 and that's what we need. So we got to have uh, what we started off with, uh, uh, an apologetic spirit as opposed mm -hmm. to blaming. Uh, then we go from that to intentionally uplifting us, e each other and making each other the standard of what's right in this world. And from there we have to have intentional acts of reconciliation. We have to do things to make the other feel as if they're loved, they're welcome. We have to intentionally put them on pedestals. We have to intentionally speak highly of them. We have to intentionally support whatever we can do to reconcile the relationship. We have to be intentional about it. Mm. I hope everybody's listening. Um, you know, there's, there, there, there is no real, there's no one real way 
of doing and, and healing. You know, I think everything is relative um, in this world. But having a viable game plan, a strategy of how we can heal and, and, and reconcile these issues is a good start. And I think he's, uh, I think Mitchell has provided some good ideas, some good principles that we definitely need to. Because I know oftentimes, thank you. One thing is people do not, yeah, no problem. We do not like to admit when we're wrong and we don't like apologizing. And that is a big thing. That causes a divide uh-huh. and a grudge yes. that people hold on to for the longest time. So I know that is real. I can speak in my own relationships. So that is real right there. Okay. Um, I'm gonna switch. Well, I'm going to switch gears. But before I switch gears, um, there's some that are probably just tuning in right now. Wednesday, 8 p.m., the pendulum. Dot Samori Swagger, a.k.a. Dot Swag. This is what you're listening to on Source Radio. And we have discussion with Brother Mitchell Chance straight out of Philadelphia. And we're just breaking down different issues. We're talking about self-hate. We're talking about black love, reconciliation. Uh, we discussed some of his books. And now we're about to switch gears and go to some other topics that may be uh, even more pressing in today's times. All right. Now. Law enforcement. So we've seen. Uh, all right. So they're releasing a video of Philando Castile getting shot and killed in the car in front of his uh, girlfriend and her four year old daughter. We've seen the verdict of the officer, uh, uh, I think his name, Gamines, so whatever his name is, he's not even important. We saw him get off. We saw, we see all these police officers getting off. I mean, they 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 are acquitted. They 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 are basically untouchable. People refer to Al Capone. They refer to Al Capone and his gang as the untouchables, right? And they say that what law enforcement is the biggest gang, and they're proven to be untouchable. So, with that being said, law enforcement is literally kicking our ass, literally. Uh-huh. And then when you pair this with these racist, white supremacist vigilantes that go on these killing sprees, like you had this oh, one white male who came, he, he came from, uh, I believe it may have been Maryland. He came to uh, New York City and went, ran up on a random black guy, stabbed him. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You had in uh, where I am, in Maryland, you had this uh, young Bowie State. Uh, he's actually a fraternity brother of mine, Alpha Alpha. Um, he's a fraternity brother of mine. He went to Bowie State. He was on the University of Maryland campus, um, minding his business with some friends. A young white uh, University of Maryland um, at College Park School was a, a member of a, a Facebook group called the All. Reich, Reich, not alt right, alt Reich, R E I C H, indicating a allegiance to the Nazi ideal. Uh, run up to him and stab him in the chest and kill him. You had these uh, white men in, hmm, was it Minnesota? But they ended up harassing. Well, it was a white man that harassed the uh, Muslim girls on the train. And you had these other white men that came to their rescue, and, and he stabbed and killed one and hurt the other. So you see this rise of these vigilante white supremacists. Couple that with law enforcement that's kicking our ass, literally. What, in Mitchell Chance's point of view and perspective, what should every black community be doing now to protect themselves and combat these type of attacks? Uh, again, we're going to start with step number one, as always. Recognize your real enemy. <laughs> we we have too many of our people who do not want to um, just look at history and understand that policing comes from slave patrol. And what 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 something starts as the root of it is what it's always going to be. We keep wanting to change things. We keep wanting to change the system, change politics. You can't change something that from its root was something totally different. So if policing in fact, in, in, in California, uh, they have on, 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 on some of their police cars um, a tradition since 1855. And in 1855, mm. you know, we were still, we were still <laughs> slaves. So 
Right. So, um, so what, what, are, what is that telling you? So mm. the, the, the first thing is recognize that the police system is your enemy. I don't care if you're in a city where you have a black police chief. I don't care if there are black police officers. The system of policing is your enemy as an African in America. Once we come to the grips with that reality, we understand that we have to do away with it. Now, that takes sacrifice because it's easy to say get these racist cops out of our neighborhoods than it is to say I'm going to step up and I'm going to patrol my neighborhood for a few hours a week. So ultimately, we have to get rid of them. We have to create our own police force within our communities and literally force the other police out. Um, and a, a lot of uh, black people, for one, they don't want to be that contentious. They don't want to be that militant. But the alternative is to the alternative is to continue to get discriminated. The alternative is to continue to get pulled out of your car uh, because you're a black male or even a black female, and you're driving a car. They don't think you're supposed to drive. So we have to police ourselves. We cannot be policed by people who are fearful of us. Mm. Because they continually say, I killed him or her because I was in fear for my life. But they don't kill the Caucasian at the same rate because they're not afraid of them. Well, if you are afraid of black people, you don't need to be a police officer in their neighborhood. How can you protect Mm -hmm. me, right? You're supposed, quote, unquote, to protect and serve. But how can you protect me if you're afraid of the people you're supposed to be protecting me from? So we have to Mm. do away completely with police systems that have any connection with the government at all. We have to have 100% police force, black police forces who have no connection whatsoever to anything Caucasian. Because, again, you can have a black police chief, like David Clark is black, and he's a sheriff in Milwaukee, but he's nothing but a Negro pen. He's He's nothing but a black man in a white system who's going to continue to perpetuate white supremacy. So if we want to get rid of what's happening to us, we have to get rid of the people who are doing, and that is the police and the police system. Mm. All right, so we need so so community group patrols and and monitoring to be on our own. A peace okay. guard. That's what I call. It. We don't we don't need to be police. We just but we need a peace guard. We we need we need some black men and, and, and maybe some women, but but definitely black men to stand up and patrol our neighborhoods and make sure everybody is safe. We need to get back to welcome women to their cars at night. You know, we need to get back to making sure our children are, you know, okay, I'm a neighborhood disciplinarian. You know, I beat the kids. <laughs> you know, but the kids all love me because even though I'm stern, they know I care. You know, so we, we, we have to get back to that. We've become too individualistic, and we're not, we're thinking, you know, what happens to somebody else has nothing to do with me. That's none of my business when that's the furthest thing from the truth. We we are oppressed as a group. We are being murdered as a group. And as long as we're thinking as individuals, uh, we'll never come from up under what we're dealing with. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, Mitchell, I got another question for you. Um, sure. This one, um, I want, so those that may have children um, that are listening, um, if you like what you hear, if you want to investigate uh, on what you hear, if you're trying to enlighten yourself, um, I want to pose this question. Um, What wise elders uh, would you recommend for young, our young audience that's listening? What wise elders would you recommend for them to research, and what books would you recommend for them to add to their library if they want to have their own little book club, or just, or just, just to have their own, you know, little resource for them? Yes, well, first, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to preface this with, with saying this: Do not think anything is too advanced for your children. When it comes to positive empowerment, we always belittle the capacity of our youth. And we think, oh, this is too much for them to grasp. Meanwhile, they're learning the intricate details of everything negative in the world can break down the most intricate ways of doing some wrong stuff, but yet we want to mm. hold back positive information because we think, oh, this book is too, is too much for them. You know, I have my daughter reading stuff, and I got to sit with her, help her with the words, but that's how, she, you know, that's how she grows a vocabulary. 
so I, I, I already talked about Booker T. Washington up from slavery. So we're going to have to go with anything by Neely Fuller, uh, anything by Francis Crest Welsing. We definitely got to go um, post-traumatic slave syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGry to must read for mm-hmm. every black person. Brainwashed by Tim Burrell. Um, the Destruction of African Civilization by um, uh, uh, Chancellor Williams. Chancellor. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, 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 Juan Williams wrote a great book called Enough. Uh, anything Amos Wilson, uh, Albert mm-hmm. Clegg, uh, uh, Cheek Answer Geop, um, uh, man, Dr. John Henry Clark. You know, it's, it's, it's so many. Once you put them in, in, your, in your Google search, they're going to give you all the contemporaries, man, any black psychologist. Uh, but those, those right there are just a few that I can just, you know, name off the top that they will, they will start. And then when you're reading a book, this is what, I, this is what happens to me. My, my book bill is ridiculous. When I'm reading a book <laughs> and they quote somebody else's book, I, I go buy that book too. And, I, you know, I, just, I got so many books right now that I haven't read yet because as I'm reading the book, I just I go get another book. <laughs> Anything by uh, Kwame Ture, uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, uh, um, Dave Hudson's name. Ah, I can't, I can't, I can't think of all the great ancestors. But that's that's. I think that's a great start right there. That's a great start right there to get you to get you yes. going. There's a lot yeah. of books between just those maybe ten people because uh, they wrote yes. they wrote a lot. And you know the philosophies and things of Marcus Garvey is a really big book. In and of itself, but yeah, man. So, and and if they don't, and if and if because and we can't, um, we can't get upset, right? If some of our youth aren't um, excited about reading, then where they learn? All of these people that I've, I've, I've mentioned, you can go on YouTube and find them speaking about what their book is about. So, so they like when I when I bought Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGraw because I just so happened to find a video on YouTube. It's a half hour clip. And I, she had like six half hour clips breaking this book down. I watched all six videos, and this I got to support the lady since I didn't watch her for two hours, three hours. <laughs> and I and I and I, I, I ordered I ordered her book. But yeah, so some some of our youth might not get it from reading. That's okay. Everybody learns differently. And if they keep they got their phone in their hand all day long, put them in front of a video that somebody is teaching, and I guarantee they'll listen and they'll they'll retain the knowledge that way. So you know we gotta you know, get out of thinking that everybody's gonna get everything the same way. Some people read. I like to read because I like to highlight. I like to write my notes in my book. You know, I can't write. I can't mm-hmm. read no ebooks. I gotta have a hard copy book. But then some people retain audibly better, and it's nothing wrong yeah. with how you get your information. So if you if you got youth that will read, buy the books. If you have youth that struggle to read, let them watch the let them watch the lectures because it's still the same information. True sure indeed. True sure indeed. Oh, also you can add me to that list of authors. <laughs> I was gonna you know I was gonna say that. <laughs> and you can YouTube and I got lectures on the books so they can watch that also. <laughs> Good, good, good. That was that was that was smooth. That was smooth, brother. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So we discussed law enforcement and white supremacists mm-hmm. that are attacking uh, a black community. Now, yes. besides of the police and white supremacists, we still have the gang element that's present in our community. Um, uh-huh. And you you know you have gangs you have cliques, um, and they contribute. I don't like to use the term black on black crime. Um, you know we used to use that, but then um, as people really started breaking down the term black on black crime, I really had to rethink and say, yeah, you know what, that's true. You know all races have their their thing with them. So I call it intra community crime. Um, but they all contribute to intra community crime and violence. So and in, and in, you know you you come from South Philly so I know you've probably seen a lot you know you like you said you kind of have little elements of it. What do you uh-huh. think? What would be some ideas that you think you could implement or recommend for people to like kind of uh, maybe bring gangs together and decrease the violence and just you know stop the crime you know. Uh-huh. Step number one: recognize the true enemy. <laughs> Every, I don't care. I don't care what issue you bring up. That's going to be the first thing because you got a, the blood going against the Crips because they don't recognize their real enemy. 
if they recognized who the real enemy was, they would come together under that commonality and fight that enemy instead of fighting themselves. So no matter what the issue, step number one, recognize your true enemy. Now, uh, as we get specifically into the gangs, the, first you have to ask this question because, I, I, like, as I said earlier, the whys are more important than the what's. Why are they joining gangs? Tupac made it very clear when he said, I rode around with the thugs, and even though they sold drugs, they showed a young brother love. It's mm. an element of masculine love that is missing in the communities. I have, I don't know how many uncles I have, but none of my uncles poured into me their gifts and their talents. So uncles who did mm. instruction and plumbing and, 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 and mechanics, and nobody taught me their trade. But the guys in the street, I had some cousins who were big in the streets, and they taught me everything about drugs. They taught me how to test the drugs to make sure that drugs were good. They taught me Mm. how to package the drugs. They put me, they gave me the drugs, and then they put me on the corner to sell the drugs and gave me the position to make the money off of the drugs. So now, this is, this is, and, and, and as they did that, I began to do that to the youth also who are coming up under me. So now, this is, this is what we really have to come to grips with. I always say this, you cannot judge a child for biting another child if they was raised by lions, right? So now, these, these, young, these young black men who are teaching other young black men negative behaviors, because I was one of them, their heart is more pure than the so-called good black man that works a job because he's not pouring nothing into the youth. So, and, and I talked about this in church one night. I, I, was, uh, I was at a meeting, and they were, you know, talking about all this, all this violence and, you know, these guys, they're doing this with these young people. I said, well, what are, y'all, what, what are y'all men teaching the youth on your block? Don't, don't even come talk to me about what gangs are teaching if you're not teaching them another option. So I, right. I believe the gangs are the problem. The gangs, I believe, are a response to the problem. And since the men on the block aren't going to teach me anything, and since the men on the block aren't going to guide me, I, and they're not going to show me a masculine love, I'm going to find my guidance and my teaching and my masculine love amongst my peers. And since we're all ignorant because we haven't learned anything, we're just going to figure this thing out on our own, and we're going to end up doing the wrong things because the so-called good men have not taken the time to pour into the youth down the street. Again, we're thinking somebody else's child isn't my problem, but then they're not your problem until that child kills your child. Uh, one one day mm. I was I was out with a brother of mine, and we were he has this thing called the 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 unprison cell. And and it, the cell is the only cell that's created to keep the youth out of prison. And so we got the microphones, and we're out in the streets, and we're talking. We're trying to get donations to help us do what we're doing. And the guy said, I ain't giving no donation. My kid's a good kid. Ooh. I said, brother, I, I wow. said, I hope none of the bad kids harm your good kids. <laughs> Real talk. So, yeah, so when we, when we look at um, the gangs, we have to ask why are they joining gangs. And when we get to the crux of the why, then we can begin to answer that. So as Tupac talked about the love component, uh, so we have to be intentional about loving uh, black men, loving young black men, but then we have to also be intentional about teaching them something. It's, you know, what do we think a young black man is going to do if he's in a bind for money and he has no kind of trade to go hang a door and make a couple of dollars real fast. Or he can't oh, he go doesn't. change somebody's alternator real quick. Or he can't go, you know, oh, I can, I can do that for you. You know, he, he doesn't have a mm-hmm. trade. I can't go cut hair. I can't, what, what, whatever it may be. What, what do you do when you're in a bind? You find yourself mm. doing what you have to do to survive. So we have to deal with those whys. It's not about just put the guns down. Well, why did you pick up the gun? Why do you? Why are you fighting mm. each other? Why did you join this gang? Why did you feel like you had to be affiliated with something? What? What? what why did you have this longing to belong? And mm. can, what can I create that would substitute this gang for you? Because if we don't have the substitute, we can't have a conversation. Right. You can't tell you, you can't tell somebody stop selling drugs, and they'd be like, okay, all right. Well, how am I pay my bills next month? The answer, <laughs> with, with no substitute, we can't properly have the dialogue. So first we have to understand 
um, the people and why they do what they do because, again, I'll probably say it over and over again, the whys are more important than the what's. We have too many, quote, unquote, good men who just look at the games and look at them as just some ignorant, thuggish, radical hoodlums and don't recognize that they are young men whose actions are cries for the good men to solve. Ladies and gentlemen, if you listen to everything that he just said and did, and you revert back to my intro, and I said, poses cogent questions for you to the analysis, the root cause analysis of your problems. You just saw him exercise that event mapping. He just he just went through the event mapping progress process to show you how people get to this level, and then what we need to do. So this is what this is what we're talking about. And that comes through dialogue and having conversations with each other, with our youth. That was excellent. Good. Good. Okay. Now, let's get political. Let's get political. Um, in 2018, the midterm elections are coming up, right? Uh, many people are dissatisfied with Donald Trump. Um, and then, you know, I know when it was the – Elections, you know, when it was November 2016, you had Hillary Rodham and Donald Trump going, and then some people were like, you know, well, black people just shouldn't even vote. Um, but, you know, you're seeing all these different uh, rollbacks of different laws. You see Trump putting different people into positions of power, and they are just stripping things away, like, bit by bit. What, what do you think, African Americans? What do you think we should be doing politically as far as elections? Should we participate, or what's just what's your political stance? My political stance is we should never participate in elections, mm-hmm. but what we should participate in is choosing who runs in an election. It is mm-hmm. frivolous to think that our vote between two people that other people have chosen is going to do anything for us because those people have no allegiance to us. Those people didn't get no donations from us. Those people didn't even come to talk to us before they decided to run. So if we have a choice between Hillary and Donald Trump, well, who said I wanted to choose either of those candidates? So voting in that that election, it just made no sense. Voting in any Mm -hmm. election where we have not sat down, critiqued the person, learned everything about the person, know the person, saw the person in action in our communities, and said, we want you to run, and we're going to be behind you and running, then voting is never going to mean anything. Because voting means absolutely nothing. Placing the candidate is what means something. It's the reason why there are super PACs. It's the reason why people are putting up millions and millions of dollars in somebody's fund for them to get elected because that's where the power is. So we got folks put money behind Trump, folks putting money behind Hillary, and again, if we recognize our enemy, both of them is our enemy, so neither one of them is going to make things either good or bad for us. But mm-hmm. the people who are behind them getting elected are the people that they are held accountable to. None of us... Mm-hmm. If, even if some places voted for Trump, they can't hold him accountable. They didn't put, they didn't place him there. So as 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 it pertains to elections, we can't just be get out the vote, get out the vote. If the midterm, the midterms are coming up, we need to be looking at who we want to run. Mm. This is who we want to run, and then all black people, we're going to vote for this person to become uh, 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 you know elected to whatever office because this is the person we chose to run. But if you're just mm. voting between two people that somebody else chose, I don't know how you think that's going to mean anything to you. Mm. Mm. I, I, I get you. I, I, I get you. I honestly do. Um, candidate placement. I, I candidate see exactly placement. what you mean. It, 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 it's power. kind of like um, you go into a, you go into a, a, a horse race. 
And they're like, well, you know, these are your horses. And they're like, you know, bet on them. And you're like, well, God, neither one of them, I'm not in favor of it. any of them, you know. Um, actually, I think there's this one horse over there in the stable that John is kind of ignoring. I mean, I'm looking at the horse's muscular stature. I'm looking at the endurance. And when I've seen it um, 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 trotting laps and, 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 and things of that nature, I would like to see that horse on the track. Let uh-huh. me put my money and everything and see if I can get that horse put into the race. So I, I get you. I, I definitely get it. Very true. I think we, we need to think along those lines. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Well, we did the political part. Now economics is also a big thing. Um, when we talk about financial um, in America, um, we always hear people talking about this $1.1 trillion that black people have in uh, spending and buying power um, and just, you know, just, just everything. But yet, for some reason or another, we're not doing well uh, when we look across the board. Uh, when we look at gentrification that's happening, we're not able to economically compete with the corporations and these uh, the new uh, people that are coming into the communities, buying up all the property, uh, foreigners coming in and buying up all the property. We're not the ones with multinational corporations. Uh, we're not the ones that's able to, as you said earlier, contribute financially to the super PACs that are funding a lot of these candidates. So economically, what is your position? What's Mitchell Chancellor's, Mitchell Chancellor's economic position as far as Blacks to keep us competitive uh, in America and globally. I think that that starts with a change in consciousness. Um, and and first, you know, I talked to you the other night about the curse of shiny things. You know, we mm-hmm. we we have to break the curse of shiny things. We are so uh, we're like children. You know, you see a child they see a phone they see it lit up and they just want to play with it because they see the light or oh, it's a flashlight or a toy with lights on it and they just want the shiny thing. And as adults we find ourselves in that same way. We want the biggest house for what reason? We want the biggest nicest car. We we we're caught up in all of the marketing. A TV a, a commercial will come on about TVs and say uh, the 80 inch television. You need the biggest TV on your block. And then the next commercial will say a TV that sits in the palm of your hand. You need them both. Why? Why? Do I need a big TV or do I need a small TV? Uh, but things are marketed to us, and we fall and we fall prey to marketing, and we just frivolously spend money on things that we don't necessarily need, and we don't want to give up some of our luxuries. So as we think about economic growth, the first the first thing has to be us being us sacrificing luxury. Uh, we have to be okay with not having the luxury items and not having the designer clothes and the most expensive car and the jewelry and the bags and all of these different things, the red bottom shoes, whether it be men or whether it be women, and the $300 sneakers. And we, we have to get our mindset to a place where we're spending money in ways that is going to benefit us individually, benefit our children, and benefit our race. But we, if, if, our, if our consciousness isn't right, talking about starting black businesses isn't even going to mean anything because we have black businesses. A lot of them fail because the consciousness of the black people is not mm-hmm. there. Where I'm, where I'm at in South Philly, right down the street, I'm, I'm a block from um, Washington Avenue. I hope nobody's trying to stalk me or anything. It's <laughs> five or six different Asian shopping centers. And I'm in Philly, but when you go in these shopping centers, you'll see place, well, Pennsylvania place, you'll see New Jersey place, you'll see Delaware place, because these Asians are, are okay with the inconvenience of leaving their state to come to where the Asian markets are. But that's the kind of mindset that you have to have. Right now, yeah. I, can build a black, I can build a black shopping mall right now that won't get the support because the consciousness isn't there. So we have to have a race first mentality, or as as Dr. Malesi Asante would say, everything has to be with Afrocentricity. We have to have everything from an African 
African-centered mindset. Where we spend our money has to be African-centered. Our education has to be African-centered. Our entertainment has to be African-centered. And when we center, when our nucleus is African, when our nucleus is race, when our nucleus is nation building, that will begin to create everything else that we need. So even if, say, say we got reparations, <laughs> we can get reparations, build a sneaker company, but if the black people's consciousness isn't right, they're still going to buy Nike over the black company. Yes, that's so true. economics can only be changed in my estimation once the consciousness of black people is changed to really have a race first ideology where I want the best for my people and I only want to be supportive of my people. And once that mindset happens, we'll begin to create the economics very easily. Mm. All right. And that is economic philosophy right there, changing the mind state to get the desired outcome and manifest it physically and tangibly. Okay. Well, I know we're running up on this clock, and I want to get I want to get a, another good question in before we go. Uh, before we go, because I don't want the, uh, the system to <laughs> interrupt. Uh, uh, one more time, uh, can you let people know how to reach you, um, and just you know everything they need to know if they're listening to following right now. Definitely. Again, you can always find me at my website, M Chance Speaks. M as initial chance, like take a chance. Speaks with an S. Mchantspeaks.com. You can go in there and watch the videos, read the blog, or purchase some material. I have five different books, has an ebook form. I also have t shirts on, on the website with my slogan, Love Black, Buy Black, and Sync Black. And uh, the, 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 the t shirts have Indinkra symbols on because we have to be connected to our African roots. You can also find me on Facebook at Mitchell Chance Speaks or on Instagram and Twitter at Mchant Speaks. So everything is some kind of variation with Mitchell Chance Speaks to make it all easy. Or you can Google me and uh, find whatever you want to find about me on there. It's pretty much all good information right now. <laughs> uh, you know, until the, until the powers that be start to hear about the work I'm doing, then you know it's going to be some kind of slander. Listen, can I, can I just go on a side real fast? Sure, as, as sure, it just sure. Came out, as it just came to my mind. Listen, yeah. stop. Asada, Asada Shakur said, only a fool lets someone tell them who their enemies are. And we will allow Caucasian media to make us feel like our own leaders are villains. We got black people who believe Matt Turner was wrong or black people mm. who believe the Black Panther Party for self-defense, which they will never say that part. They'll never say for self-defense. They will only say Black Panthers. And people that think the Black Panthers were just some group that hated white people and wanted to kill cops. Well, no, they were protecting themselves and their people from the oppression and from uh, the brutality that they were facing from cops. So I was just joking about what they might say about me as things begin to grow with me. But we, we cannot allow them because we know they're, step number one, recognize your enemy. We know they mm -hmm. are our enemy. So how can we allow them to tell us that, Somebody black is a problem for our people. And now women understand this. I do not want to fool. I do not want to perpetuate any kind of rape culture because rape is a, is, is a heinous offense. But in the history of this country, the first crime that, that, that they charge black men with when they're being too militant and going against the system is rape. That's the first thing they do because they know that women will hear the rape and it will, they will feel empathy for the victim and then they'll go against a black leader because they were accused of rape. And that is just historically just look at it. That's, the, that's what they always do the moment somebody starts talking against the system. When Michael Jackson starts talking about uh, uh, Tommy Mottola and starts talking <laughs> yeah. about the devils of the industry, the first thing mm -hmm. they accused him of was rape. When Bill Cosby starts talking about uh, empowering us, our, our neighborhoods after he did the pound case speech and he was traveling around the country doing town hall meetings, he was accused of rape back then way before these allegations. The moment a leader comes up to do something for their people, if you just look at the history, and again, I'm not trying to push the culture because it's a heinous crime, but just know they will always try to vilify our leaders 
so you won't follow them. That's just history. True. And again, true, I apologize if, if that made anybody feel any kind of way because that's not what I'm attempting to do, but I do want to expose you to the truth of history. That's all. Mm. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's important and it's imperative that people understand the game and how it's played. It's a game of chess and strategy. If you don't understand that, then you can keep playing checkers until you jumped out the game, and that's real. Um, all right. So we're we're winding down. Um, I want to get this one question to you before uh, we're out of here or the system closes us out, and it's this. Uh, education is another big mountain to climb. Uh, they're closing mm-hmm. a lot of public schools. They're opening charter schools. They have the school mm-hmm. prison pipeline. Um, high quality education comes with a hefty price tag. What would you say are some things that parents need to consider or start doing to ensure that our children remain scholastically competitive in the 21st century? Homeschool mm-hmm. and create small schools. Create. Um, here in Philly, it's something called the Lotus Academy. It's like I have a meeting with them next week. The Lotus Academy started from, and there was a bunch of college-educated parents who just did not want their children in, in the public school system. So they decided to create a small school with just their children. It started out with about 20 of them. And they taught their own children, and it turned into the only black independent school, not charter school, because a charter school is just as bad as a regular public school, a black independent school where everything is taught uh, from an Afrocentric uh, point of view and it's teaching the truth. You know, they ain't teaching that Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin were good people. letting you know that they were, they were evil murderers and, and slave owners. But so we, we have to take charge of our own education. Malcolm X said only – Malcolm X says, and uh, um, only a fool will send their children to be educated by their enemy. And that's mm-hmm. the, the, the whole fight for integration and ground versus border education. All of that was we fought for the right to let our children get indoctrinated by the people that hate them. So the only <laughs> solution, again, as Brother Malcolm would eloquently say, for the solutions for black people in America is separation. We have to separate ourselves. So we can't be a part of this education system that is undereducating and miseducating our children. We have to be able to sacrifice and say, all right, we're going to put the time and effort into teaching our own children. We can't keep pushing this responsibility on somebody else and then get mad when they don't do, do a good job. As they everybody said, you want to get a job done, then do what? Do it yourself. So that's my True. solution. And if your children are in a regular public school or private school or whatever, Make sure you also have them reading different things. Make sure they also have some. Like I said, my, I make my daughter read the same books I read. I put them. I, I put them right in front of her. Put them right in front of her to read, and whatever she can't understand, mm. I sit down and help her with it. I make her write book reports after every chapter. We have to be able to take and take, take control over what goes into our youth mind. And if they're a part of another school, we can at least be giving them some more African centered understanding and learning from our elders. All right, all right. Well, Brother Chance, it has been a pleasure chopping it oh, up yes, with you man. and getting I your insight. It. Oh, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. You're always welcome back on the show, man. Um, definitely appreciate it. Um, everybody, uh, you got the information. You know how to get in contact with this brother. Uh, we'll definitely try to get him back on uh, sometime in the future. Uh, is Mitchell Chan. Um, this is Dr. Samori Swagger for The Pendulum. Every Wednesday, 8 p.m., Law Talk Radio, Source Radio, okay? And we, we do our thing. If you want to hit me on Twitter, my Twitter handle is Dot Swag 6 D-O-C-S-W-A-G-G-0-6. Um, if you want to go to my website, it's www.blackladder.net, black like the color, ladder like the device you climb, Dot net. It is not a dot com. And you can go to Amazon, iTunes, Google Play, or CD Baby, and you can get my audio book. You can also get uh, my music um, there. Just type in my name. And we always got to thank our sponsors. Our sponsors are Scott Kerr's Foundation. Uh, we have Urban Grandstand Digital. And Meet My Types Matchmaking. And they make everything possible. Now, I know this the system may um, – uh, Brother Mitchell, are you still there? 
Yeah, I'm still here. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, the sister may get the may the sister may just say, you know what? I'm closing the door uh, on on the other conversation. Uh, but I want to ask this real quick. If we lose if we lose anything, uh, it is what it is. So real quick, some people say, look, blacks, you should go back to Africa and just start our own. You know, just join with some of the African nations there and just forget about America. And try and get citizenship in Africa and some of these African countries. Um, and then that's one question. And then also. Uh, some people are like, look, Obama had the opportunity to pardon Marcus Garvey, and he didn't pardon Marcus Garvey. Um, so what are your thoughts on those two things? <laughs> well, firstly, if you thought Obama was going to do anything to black people, <laughs> what, what did he do that make you think he was going to exonerate Marcus Garvey? He didn't do anything to black people. Um, hmm. As far as going back to Africa, that's a great idea and philosophy, but if we can't get people to come together where they live at right now, how are we going to come together to go to another continent? <laughs> so, I mean, that's a great idea for us to go back and, you know, take control of the continent, but we got to establish a unity where we are in order to do that, because if not, we'll just go over there and be discombobulated and not do what we need to do, as a lot of our African nations are over there are discombobulated and still controlled by Caucasians. So we got to get our unity right here. And, um, before we could think about moving somewhere else, in my opinion. All right. I, I agree. I think it's very logical what you said. All right. Uh, Mr. Chance, thank you for your time and your contribution uh, to you the show, good me. brother. No doubt, man, anytime. All right. All right, so have a good night. We are, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You have a peaceful night. So, Nation, we are out. Hope to see you next Wednesday at 8 p.m. And we are out of here. Peace.